We live in an incredible age of information. More and more, we're discovering that we've been lied to and misled about much of our human history. Corey Hughes is providing profound revelations about World War I, World War II, the JFK assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination, and much, much more on his new Substack, Bloody History. Subscribe now for as little as $5 monthly. Just click that link right in the description to get started now and learn about our true history. Welcome back to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew. Today, my guest is Maya Zahira. First, a couple of announcements. We're resuming our fundraiser for our upcoming film, Doors of Perception. We had a couple of roadblocks, equipment breakdowns, but we're hoping to be able to resume post-production as soon as possible. The release of the film may be delayed just a bit. If you would like to help with a donation, anything is greatly appreciated. Any donation of $50 or more, you'll get a one-hour, one-on-one discussion with myself, either recorded for a podcast or private, a pre-release showing of our new film, your name in the credits of that film, and a PDF of a warning from history. And again, thank you all so much for the incredible love and support over the years. If you'd like to help in other ways, you can get a Rockfin Premium Membership. Go to rockfin.com slash FKN Plus. You'll get access to all our premium content. And you can download our audio episodes directly through Spreaker. That's always easy and free for you. Today I want to welcome back to the show Maya Zahira. She is a visionary teacher, mystic, author, and spiritual mentor whose mission is to educate and empower truth seekers with the most powerful and effective methods for energetic self-care, spiritual empowerment, and psychic protection. Maya, welcome back. How you doing? Thank you so much for having me back, Chris. So great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you back. I really enjoyed our discussion last time. And the last time you were on, we went into the unseen world of dark attachments and spiritual parasites. And today we're going to dive a little deeper and even get into the different types of entities that can affect us, why, and again, how to clear them. But it's been a while since you've been on. Remind the audience just a little bit about yourself and your work before we get into this. Sure. So hi, everybody out there in podcast land. Uh, I'm Maya Zahira, and um, I have been a spiritual teacher for over 30 years. But the last 10 years have been primarily focused on the area of psychic protection. And if you had told me years ago that I would be in this specific field, I would have told you you were crazy that's never going to happen because I was totally into the love and light movement, all things positive. I didn't want to look at any of the negative stuff, but uh, the universe or the powers that be or God or whatever you want to call it had other plans for me because in 2016, I ended up going through a major psychic attack that was totally unexpected. There was a, um, specific type of entity which i'll talk about today that was attached to a healer a colleague that i went to for a session she thought that she was working with a council of angels and so did all of her followers Mm. but instead it was a dark entity that she was working with uh, probably unbeknownst to her and so i came under attack it was a very confusing 
six weeks because it was a trickster entity. And so it was really good at shape-shifting and pretending to be all sorts of things, not just the Council of Angels, that uh, the way that it was fooling her, but it was shape-shifting from entity to entity, all, all different forms from fairies to it was pretending to be demons, it was pretending to be angels, it was like, you name it. Mm. So it was very confusing. Anyway, fast forward, long story short, I finally was able to figure out what was going on. Um, one of the frustrating aspects of the whole attack was that when I reached out to my fluffy bunny, I say this with love in my heart, when I reached out to my fluffy bunny community of colleagues, they were all like, negative entities don't exist. Mm. That didn't happen to you. Like, That's such a red flag for me. And when anybody <laughs> says that, I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what I, what I... I um, don't usually say this, but I think it and just chuckle. And I think, well, you might not believe in them, but they believe in you. Yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I made it through the attack. I'm laughing about it now, but it was definitely no laughing matter. I really, without going into all of the nitty gritty of what happened, um, at a certain point, I did think that maybe that entity might kill me. It was a very serious attack, and um, I finally was able to figure out what was going on. I finally was able to identify what type of entity it was and then to clear it, but again, not with any help from most of my colleagues. I did have a few um, really beneficial people step up who gave me um, nuggets of information that I really needed at the time, and so with those golden nuggets. And then along with me using my intuition and my skills, I was able to clear it. When I was going through all of that, though, I remember in the middle of the night, being afraid to go to sleep when I was in the thick of things. And thinking, you know, I've reached out for help, but nobody seems to have the answers there, there just doesn't seem to be the right kind of support out there. And I don't believe that I'm the only person going through this. If I'm going through this, there's got to be lots of other people going through similar situations, and I bet they're looking for help too, and they're maybe not finding help either. And I thought about how the attack itself was very traumatizing, but the not being able to find help was equally traumatizing, and and the gaslighting and all of the all of that, the victim blaming and all of that. And I said to myself, you know. If I get through this, when I get through this, I want to start um, a support group at least. Well, then my work has turned into much more than a support group over the last many years. But I did start a support group and I still have it. It's a Facebook group called Psychic Protection Sanctuary. And it's just so important for people who've gone through any type of psychic attack or entity attack to be able to share their stories and just to wrap this all up, I'll say, I was looking online this morning. I had like a little, I had some personal time. I was looking for some resources, not spiritual resources, but but other types of things. And the, I was looking into two different groups that I was thinking about joining or signing up for. And both of them, I found out the whole idea behind them is that you're not allowed to speak about anything negative. You can only speak about positive things. And this is a no negativity zone. And I thought, thank goodness I have my free group and my paid group. Because all these people who've been through entity attacks and like horrific things, can you imagine joining a group and being told, well, you're here for support, but you can't talk about anything negative or scary. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I will say this. We are talking about negative things today. We're talking about dark things. But I believe, and I think you do too, Chris, this is why you have your channel, your podcast, is that it's so important for us to um, put the fear over to the side mm. and be brave enough to look at the realities that are really out there. Yes. Because I tell you what, all the people, all the love and lighters, and I used to be one of them, all the love and lighters who think that negative stuff doesn't exist, I've had you know, hundreds, I don't know, I've lost count, so many 
spiritual seekers come to me who used to be love and light fluffy bunny until they started to come under attack so the point being even if you don't believe in it and you believe that only positive exists the negative can still hurt you and i've heard a lot of people say this um um idea with me which is well i hope that if i if i just focus on positive energy nothing dark will touch me and i don't want to alarm anyone or initiate fear but we need to just be brave enough to look at the reality and say actually even if you don't look at the dark and you polarize onto all the love and light dark uh, spiritual situations can still attack you and in fact sometimes they the dark entities love to attack those who are really all about love and light so the way that we find empowerment the way that we grab onto this and find power in a positive way not putting our head in the sand sort of way but in a really truly embodied empowered way is to learn about what is out there so we're going to dive into five of the most common types of negative entities today excellent that's a perfect introduction now mm -hmm. i wanted to get your insights into something before we break down these four types of entities i had a quite a few discussions actually recently with different colleagues about a possible physical nature of these attachments and we look at parasites microscopic parasites and when you zoom in close enough these things look like demons these things look like little <laughs> aliens and we speculated if there is a physical aspect of these in the microscopic world but in the macro sense in the spiritual realms and the unseen realms these could be the same things that we're dealing with except on a more energetic basis what do you think about that <laughs> well, my spiritual nerd brain is so excited that you brought up this topic. I mean, it's one of those topics that's super interesting and it's also weird and mm. a little bit freaky too, you know. Um, but yeah, I definitely have ideas on this. So let's break this up into two categories. We're talking about microscopic beings like um, viruses, bacteria, mm. pathogens, even candida in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, yeast, all of those things that can overgrow in our body if our if our microbiome goes out of balance, those those can turn into something negative. I mean, we all have some of that in our body. It's not necessarily negative, but when we have an overgrowth, then that consciousness starts to take over. Mm -hmm. And I use that word on purpose. The consciousness, those are little tiny beings. They are beings, even though they're microscopic, they're beings, they have consciousness, and they want to take over um, the, the terrain. And I do definitely believe that an overgrowth of microscopic whatever, whether whatever kind of pathogen in a person's body, I see it as a form of... Um, I'll call it psychic attack or negative spiritual interference. Mm -hmm. And then I was going to break it off into the other category, which is we have, so we have the physical pathogens, the physical microscopic beings, but then we also have a type of entity, which wasn't on my five list of five today, but let's talk about it. There are also spiritual entities that are microscopic in size. Mm. And I'll kind of broaden it, though, because we have um, entities that are like little insects, uh, worms, spiders, um, mm -hmm. etheric spiders, and then we have all the way down to the microscopic. And, um, the, and they're not physical, but they're energetic. And a lot of times I will see somebody who has, let's say... Um, Let's say that clairvoyantly I see worms in one of their chakras. I see a worm coming out of one of their chakras. And then it turns out that they, so, so, and that's spiritual, right? That's, a, that's an etheric worm, but that also they have found out through medical testing that they have actual parasites. Mm -hmm. They have actual worms. Mm -hmm. uh, we all, again, we all have some, 
Mm -hmm. Every human being has some, but they have an overgrowth in their digestive system. So a lot of times I'll find that somebody has uh, both. So they have the spiritual version and the physical version. And back to the physical version, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, many years ago I had a candida overgrowth. So I learned a lot about candida, yeast infection in the digestive system that can also go into other parts of the body. And candida are known for being able to cross the blood brain barrier. And so they, they literally can affect your thoughts. They will cause you to want to eat sweets because sugar actually feeds the yeast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's kind of freaky that you have these little microscopic beings in you that are trying to control your mind. Well, it reminds me of those types of mushroom spores that get into different insects and then attach to their brain and mind control them to just be planted in a certain space, die, and let the mushroom grow out of them. That's terrifying. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's really the same thing, mm. but different different types of um, parasitic beings will affect uh, humans or certain kinds of animals. And thankfully, that type of mushroom doesn't affect yeah. human beings <laughs> like that. That's that's pretty freaky. But um, yeah, so that's what I have to say about that um the the spiritual version of the microscopic entities can be cleared through energy clearing shamanic work um so you can actually clear those critters from your energy field you can do it yourself or you can have someone work on you in an energy worker in person or someone who knows how to do it long distance um and then as for the physical Uh, types of microscopic beings, I think we would need to take a two-pronged approach to addressing those that are showing up in the physical. Mm -hmm. We would need to um, do the health protocols, like whether it's herbs that kill off the pathogens or the parasites, um, and also changing how we eat so we're not feeding the parasites, Uh, But I have also observed that when it comes to both physical and spiritual parasites, a lot of times the person has um, a longstanding personality or behavioral imbalance of boundary issues Mm. where, and it's unconscious, it's not the person's fault. It's not like they're inviting these um, microscopic entities to come in on purpose. But most of the clients that I've worked with who've had a lot of these kinds of issues, they also, when they tell me about their personal life, they have a lot of boundary issues as well. And so I think that if someone has physical parasites or um, these physical parasitic um, beings within them and overgrowth, they, they need to do the health protocols, whatever their practitioner recommends. But then they also need to look at taking um, sovereignty over their physical and energetic space. This is my home. Mm. This is my space. I'm in charge here. Uh, I've, I actually had conversations. I mentioned that I had a candida overgrowth years ago. I actually had conversations with the candida and said, Hey guys, this is my place. Y'all need to go. Mm. <laughs> so it's important to set boundaries that there, there's boundary imbalances going on also when those entities get out of balance great that was a great explanation about the micro uh, microscopic aspects of this now let's talk about the different types that you came here to discuss Mm -hmm. okay so today we're going to talk about the five most common types of entities that I observe in my personal life and in my professional life working with clients. I have been a clairvoyant my whole life and uh, all the other clairs as well. And so what I'm going to share with you is firsthand, my own firsthand experiences and observations. So I want to clarify that what I'm sharing with you isn't information based on a religious dogma or religious 
scriptures or anything like that, you know, with all due respect to all, all of that out there, what I'm sharing with you today is based on what I've seen, experienced, et cetera, firsthand. Um, and so let's, I'm going to give you an umbrella overview of the list first, and then I'll break it down. I'll break down each one. So the first most common um, entity, this won't surprise people, negative entity is demons. So no big surprise. The second on my list is gin. And if uh, as some of your viewers will have heard of gin, some of you won't know what that is, and I'll explain it. And the third is ghosts. So discarnate humans. And the fourth is thought form entities. Again, mm -hmm. if you don't know what that is, I will explain it. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth one is uh, kind of a special category that I call false light entities. So let's dive in. And of course, I know, mm -hmm. Chris, uh, feel, free, feel free to... Uh, interrupt as because i can just talk and talk so interrupt if you want to direct me or ask sure. a certain question so let's start with demons sure. um all right so just look at my notes here okay um so again this is based on what i've seen and not based on christian scripture or anything or dogma or anything like that mm -hmm. uh i actually the first demons that i saw that i can recall were when I was a teenager. So I've seen them for a long time. And uh, over the years, I've discerned that there's a hierarchy in the demonic realm. So there, I'm going to start with the middle of the hierarchy, and then I'll go down and then back up. The middle of the hierarchy, uh, those are the ones that I think we see a lot in like Hollywood movies, um, what I see clairvoyantly does look pretty similar. It's a, a humanoid uh, sized per, um, person looking creature. So they, they look like a human, they have a human face. Their skin might be a different color, uh, either red or gray or like a light greenish. So their skin is not regular human colors that we have in the human race. When I have seen the mid-level of demons, they usually have horns. And I don't know why that is. I don't know like the origin, origin, origins of why they have horns. But in the cases when I've seen this level of demon, I will either see them where they're, they're standing by themselves or I will see the, the demon superimposed over a living person. So, for example, there's this person that I know, the person walks into the room, I have suddenly switched into my clairvoyant vision, I see this person that I know, and I also see a demon face superimposed over the person, the human being's face, mm. and I'll see, uh, in one case, I saw these little stubby horns, in another case, the big ram's horns. Uh, so they've all all been different, right? All different, not all the same. The mid-range demons are the ones that I see that I'm gonna I'm gonna use the word possess that possess people the most, but in a way that's less Hollywood and more subtle, because the high ranking uh, demons, which I'll talk about in a minute, that. Those are the ones that cause levitation, <laughs> okay? But most of the people who have a demon attachment have a mid mid range demon. That that mid, that demon, the middle range demon, is of um, average intelligence and loves to create suffering, and will either be hanging out in the person's energy field or or will actually step into the person. So the person. The person's consciousness is still sort of there, but then the demon will have moments when they're running the show. Mm -hmm. The person uh, observing might see that their friend's eyes change. Maybe their eyes just look weird, or their eyes turn black, mm -hmm. or their eyes turn red, um, and their voice might change. So I grew up with, I was adopted when I was a baby, so I was 
raised by parents that were not biologically related, but they were my parents. My mother who raised me, this would describe her. She, her voice would change. Her mm. eyes would turn black. Um, no one else in the family talks about this, <laughs> but uh, this is what I saw many, many times with her. So let's drop down to the lower ranking demons. The lower ranking demons, how I have seen them is they are like creatures. Now, I want to ask you They're something be before we get too deep hard. into that. Primarily, yes. will these mid-range demons feed off of negative emotions that they create, such as arguments or fights, yeah. degenerate sexual energy? How, yeah. how far will these mid-range demons take a person? Yes. So actually, um, yes to all of that. <laughs> and all of the hierarchy of demons will actually participate in all in all of the above of what you just mentioned mm -hmm. and um so the main thing that all of the demons would like to do is to create human suffering so they will um, activate negativity they'll create arguments they'll uh, put a lot of darkness into a person's mind create depression mm. they will um, initiate or worsen addictions because again they just want suffering and they feed off of that energy so that's whether it's the mid-range or the high the upper part of the hierarchy or the creature level ones they they in their own way the the difference in the hierarchy is a little bit in how they how they appear and also level of intelligence and how dangerous they are but across the board they all want to create suffering and chaos and lack of peace mm. Mm -hmm. okay yeah. now you were getting into the lower levels sure yeah the lower hierarchy these are creatures to me, they look like a cross between gargoyles and flying monkeys. They're about that size. Uh, they can vary in their appearance. Um, and again, since they're creatures, they tend to be very low intelligence, uh, working more on primal instincts as opposed to uh, the mid-range and the higher level that, that are more intelligent. But they still will do all of the things that you described. They will uh, try to initiate um, sexual energy so they can feed off of that. All the whole range of demons will will do that. Um, they'll they'll try to initiate suffering. they'll they'll siphon a person's life force energy, all of that. Um, and sometimes I'll see a combination of um, the different levels in a person's energy field. Hmm. So, but the main thing um, is the lower levels are less intelligent. Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So they're they're still troublemakers, but they uh, and they they do all of the negative aspects. They feed off of energy. They create suffering, but they're they're at creature level intelligence, mm. right? Right. Um, and then we have the higher. Let's jump up to the higher level of the hierarchy. These beings are, um, I feel they're very ancient. The, the upper levels uh, of the hierarchy are ancient, ancient. Uh, they are extremely powerful to a degree that um, I don't want to be around them at all. You know, I'm extremely careful if I uh, encounter, I actually encountered one, um, when I went to a Catholic conference and they were doing some ceremony and this thing showed up and was pretending to be, um, Mary and then Jesus. And, um, so the higher, the, uh, the upper level of the hierarchy can, uh, they are more adept at shape-shifting than the lower end of the hierarchy. So the higher up you go, the more the more they can shape shift into other forms, um, and the higher level ex they're extremely intelligent in a psychopathic sort of way. 
right? So they're mm-hmm. they're like Machiavellian, like they they want to destroy a person's life, or there will be this level of trickery. Like th- this is the level of demon that that will, uh, you know, really uh, cause someone to sell their soul to the mm-hmm. devil or. Would, would you say that you this is also the level that, that a lot of the very powerful groups that may try to control things on this planet are dealing with? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a whole mess of demons. I think that that mid-level to upper-level demons are involved with the dark cabal. Mm-hmm. I think I think they all love to have their finger in the pie, and it's not just the upper levels. Right. Okay, so the upper levels of the hierarchy, they are less common on the earth plane. So we don't see as many of them as we do the the demonic creatures and the mid-level demons. But when they do show up, anybody who is sensitive at all will feel the, I mean, it is a palpable sense of evil. I get chills right now just thinking about it. So, um, and then we've got these three categories, but then let's let's kind of take those categories and put them off to the side and acknowledge that there are some demons that tend to specialize in certain things. So a lot of them are just more general. They they just want to create suffering, but there are some that are specifically sexual demons that their MO is to activate sexual energy in order to feed off of it and they usually want to want to create distortion like create sexual energy in a just distorted sort of way Mm. that's not natural to the person's natural tendencies because i want to be clear sexual energy is natural it's a positive thing it can be very healing but that's not how these demons are working with that energy they're mm. they're feeding off of it they're they're trying to create um darkness within humans confusion about self-identity um all sorts of things but it's mostly about feeding off of life force energy mm. anything you want to know anything that i haven't answered yet about demons well I have a few questions, but they're going to be general questions after we cover all of the entities. So not as of okay. yet, but we can move okay. on to the next type if you'd like. Sure. Uh, just a couple of things I didn't mention mm. before that a lot of people, when they encounter a demon, even if they are not clairvoyant, even if they can't see entities, they might smell a uh, smell of sulfur or death, like rot, something rotting, death. Uh, that's a very common uh, thing that happens when people go on um, paranormal investigations and there's demonic activity in the building. A lot of times the people will report smelling that sul- sulfur kind of smell or the mm-hmm. smell, it smells like a, a crypt, like there's death in the air. Uh, that's that's a very common demonic phenomenon. Mm, very so let's go on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So before we go on to the next one, just reiterating for everybody that, um, you know, there is a chance for any person on the planet that uh, that they'll end up having some type of paranormal situation in their life. And I'm a big believer that if you know what you're dealing with, or even if you're not psychic, even if you're not clairvoyant, if you have the information and then you have a an experience of some kind, something happens in your home or when you're visiting a place, something happens, you have the information that you say, okay, I think we encountered a demon. And then we have some ideas of what we'll circle back around at the end and give a few basic ideas on how to clear clearing um, entities sometimes can be complicated. It depends on the type of entity, but I think it's really important to know even before you've had those kinds of experiences to have that knowledge in your pocket Mm -hmm. so that if you run into something uh, that you'll know, like if you walk into a building at night, 
and you're like, oh, this is all the symptoms that that lady talked about of uh, a demon. Well, we should leave. Right. Because <laughs> right? the, the longer you stay, the more chance that demon is going to want to attach to you. Mm. And a demo- uh, just saying, a demonic attachment is not fun. It's not a cool thing. Doesn't sound like so- it. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Okay. So let's go on to number two. All right. Uh, the second most common entity that I run into is a jinn, and this can be spelled J-I-N or J-I-N-N or D-J-I-N-N. And the reason for the various spellings is because the word comes from Arabic, which has a different alphabet than uh, than the alphabet that, that uh, we Westerners use. So uh, it is spoken jinn, but you can spell it in all sorts of ways. So the idea of jinn actually comes from from the Middle East and the holy book, the Quran, speaks about jinn quite a bit. But the important thing that we need to know is that just because the idea and the folklore and the mythology and the holy books talk about uh, jinn, it's not, this is not just a Middle Eastern um, situation. Okay, this is not just something that happens in the Middle East or in a certain part of the world. Uh, in my work, I've personally encountered jinn. The, uh, the story that I told at the beginning of the shapeshifter entity that was pretending to be a council of angels, mm-hmm. that was a jinn. That was my first head-on collision with a jinn. And then after that, I've had several personal encounters and I've worked with several clients since I work online, I've had clients all over the world, and there are clients all over the world. I've got clients right now in you know, Sweden and in um, uh, the the UK and in America and all sorts of places that are having gin issues. Mm. So we need to remember they can be anywhere. Uh, now, we might question, like, maybe they originated, like, in the Middle East. I don't know. But currently, they're everywhere. They're all over the place. And this is an example of even if you don't believe in something or even if you don't know about something, it can still happen to you. Mm -hmm. Because when I went through my encounter in 2016 and I told somebody about what was happening, they said, that sounds like a djinn. And I said, no, it's not. Because I've never heard of a gin before. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Therefore, it isn't happening. Mm. Well, it was happening, right? So yeah. let's talk about what they are. Mm. Uh, I've uh, seen gin in a few different forms. So their natural state when they're not shape shifting, because their their main thing that they do is shape shift. That these are the shape shifters. Okay. The main their their original form when they're not shape shifting is what the Quran calls flameless fire. So they're plasma beings. They're plasma beings. I actually caught the one that I was dealing with on camera. Oh, wow. It appeared over my shoulder at the other place where I was living. Thank goodness, not here. And um uh, and it and it looked like energy. And I also saw it above me when I was in bed. It attacked me very violently, and it was hovering above me. And it was in that plasma form. And then, as I've worked with clients, I've seen seen that I've seen gin in plasma form in those instances as well. But more frequently, they will show up in their shape shifted form. So jinn are master shapeshifters. They are the most masterful shapeshifters that out of any other entities that I've ever encountered. A lot of people think of demons as being great shapeshifters. Not at all compared to jinn. Jinn can pretend to be anything. They, in fact, it's extremely common for them to pretend to be any of these things. Fairies, elementals, angels, Jesus, Mary, uh, any of the ascended masters that that people work wow. with. Uh, I actually saw a jinn shapeshift into a whole pantheon of Greek gods and goddesses. Uh, that same jinn 
when the Greek gods and goddesses didn't fool me, it then shapeshifted. Actually, I've got the order reversed first. It shapeshifted into a council of aliens, and it told me this was a few years after my original encounter. This was my second major run-in with a djinn that I encountered at a New Age bookstore, at a New Age gift gift shop, and that thing followed me home, and it pretended to be... The Council of Orion. Wow. It said, we are we are the Council of Orion. We understand that you are a truth seeker, and you could channel these important messages for the world, oh. and you would be an important person. And as this was happening, I thought, oh, no wonder, because it was very convincing. I, I was like, this is very convincing. If I didn't already know about Jin, if I didn't know how they feel, how they set like how how they come through i i might have been fooled and i thought no wonder so many channelers yes. are being fooled by jen right what now I, this is important because, because this, i think this is happening on a very large scale right now and i've is. experienced this through many people that are quote unquote channelers and from what I understand, these entities deal a lot with flattery and the ego and pumping oh, yeah. up your ego to make oh, yeah. you feel special. Like oh, yeah. you're a receiver of this mm-hmm. special message and only you can mm-hmm. bring this to humanity. And it really mm-hmm. pumps mm-hmm. the people up and it's hard for them to understand mm-hmm. that they're dealing with a trickster entity that they're not working for their mm-hmm. best interest. They're working for this entity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I am just so, I mean, it's bad It's bad that that's happening, but I am just so happy to hear you talk about this because I've been talking about this for a few years now, and I feel like I'm shouting out into an empty cavern. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm saying, hey, all you guys, that's the entity that you're channeling isn't what you think that it is. And you hit the nail right on the head. I actually experienced firsthand the flattery and the the ego stroking mm. and i thought wow it's uh, you know i i don't uh, i have a healthy sense of ego but i don't i don't um like i can't be controlled by ego and flattery like that that just doesn't work with me so when it was trying to uh flatter me and say oh you'll be a really important person blah blah i was like that doesn't work for me i don't care mm. about that you know, and then and then it shapeshifted, tried to pretend to be um, gods and goddesses, and I was like, "No, that's ridiculous. I know what this is." And then it shifted again into demons, and I went, "Oh, how fascinating!" Now that because uh, when it shapeshifted into the gods and goddesses, it said, "We are here to protect you from that entity." Mm. <laughs> That was messing with you. I'm like, no, you actually are that entity. And then it shapeshifted into demons. And I said, how fascinating, since those other forms didn't work for me. Now you're going to try to scare me. And I actually, here's where it gets really tricky is when a djinn shapeshifts into demons, and this is what happened with my original djinn attack, I thought I had uh, demons attacking me because the djinn was shape-shifting into all sorts of things, including demons. And so a person will think that they're dealing with demons, but it's actually a djinn pretending to be demons, because the the whole idea with djinn is uh, they also are very psychopathic. They're major psychopaths, and they want to confuse a person. They want to create chaos and... What they'll do is they will manipulate things in however they're shape-shifting and how they're interacting with you. They'll manipulate things to get you to welcome it in. So this is why it will show up as someone's benevolent spirit Mm -hmm. guide or whatever uh, so that the person says, "Oh, welcome in," <laughs> and then, and then, and then the the, the gin hooks in, and then um, gin just they, it's not a mu- it's not as much with the demons in delighting in suffering, uh, the gin delight in creating confusion, and that gin love to be worshipped. Mm. 
this is why they will often pretend to be angels or fake Jesus, not the real Jesus, uh, or whatever other ascended master, because they suck up all that worship energy. They have huge egos and they love it. So they they will love to go to to like show up at an event where there's a lot of worship, mm. whether it's a religious event. I actually went to a Christian church where there was a huge, huge gin floating above the congregation. And it was just sucking up all of that uh, worship energy. That I found that very disturbing <laughs> because I was raised Christian mm-hmm. and Catholic. And I was like, why, why does God allow that? I don't know. But mm. uh, And then I have seen Jen do that same sort of nonsense at a lot of New Age mm-hmm. events. And I'm not anti-church. I'm not anti-New Age. But we need to understand that there's certain kinds of entities like Jen who love to infiltrate what are supposed to be safe spaces mm-hmm. because people aren't aren't anticipating right. anything like yeah. that. And like I said, I I see that this could be a, an epidemic right now, especially with the yeah. misleading and confusing information that is coming out of the spiritual quote unquote truth community right now. And I think it's something we really need to be aware of, like you said. Yeah, and uh, Jen are working through a lot of channelers mm. that are very well. Most of them are very well-meaning. They they are they have a big heart, a pure heart. They want to be helping humanity, but they don't want to see the truth about what's going on. Maybe there was a little bit of ego stoking or some mm. insecurity that was activated by the jinn so that the jinn could could take hold and so there's all these messages coming forth in the truther movement and the new age movement that are channeled messages whether it's from the aliens or ascended master so and so or or whatever and the messages are uh it's very much like how a human psychopath would operate where there's 80 percent truth and 20 percent mm-hmm. lies Because people are not going to believe a bunch of nonsense. Actually, people sometimes do believe a bunch of nonsense. But um, it's easier to trick people by using that tactic of 80% truth, 20% lies. And the the lies uh, come through very seamlessly. It's usually with the intention to throw people off track again whether it's in the truther movement or wherever it's to to get people chasing their tail in the wrong Mm. direction instead of um, seeing whatever is true that's happening on the planet um so it's it's to keep keep people off off target and ungrounded right on great information anything else about jen before we move on uh, yeah, I'll add one more thing. Uh, just a word of warning uh, to people dealing with gin. I have helped many people get rid of gin issues, but I've learned along the way, especially from some of my first personal experiences with gin, that you can't approach them in the same way that you do demons. And this is what I mean. In the Catholic exorcism tradition, it's all about being super aggressive and like aggressively forcing the demon to leave the person, right? If you take that type of aggressive or even assertive approach with a jinn, the result can be uh, really horrible, Mm. okay? the gin, and I'll just be straightforward. The reason why I learned this was the second encounter that I had with a gin, where I mentioned a few minutes ago that I went into a new age bookstore and this thing followed me home. I pretended to be aliens and demons and everything. I was very aggressive in setting boundaries, which normally setting energetic boundaries is a good mm-hmm. thing. I learned the hard way that when I set aggressive boundaries with this gin, within a couple of days, my cat was dead. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I won't go into all of the why and how, 
Uh, thankfully, I lived through it, but it was um, like that. That Jen was pissed mm. that I set that boundary, and it probably didn't want to kill me. It wanted to make me. It wanted to uh, punish me for setting the boundary. Right. And uh, and like a lot of people who have pets, this was not just a pet. This was a very beloved pet, and so the idea was to punish mm. me. And so the so Jin will I've seen again and again that if you set very direct boundaries with them, they will lash out, whether it's causing harm to a loved one or uh, some other kind of harm directly to you. Or uh, what I've seen quite commonly is that they will just create a huge upheaval of chaos and you know horrible situations in the person's life if they set really hard boundaries with the mm -hmm. gin so what we have to do is more of a backdoor approach and this is what i do with my clients is we work on and this of course takes a while but we work on addressing and healing through spiritual work and shamanic methods we work on addressing and healing all of the root causes all of the core wounds, uh, any past life connections with that gin, like all of the doorways where that gin might be able to come in in the first place, we actually close all those doorways, right? So it's more of a backdoor approach. Mm. So I would just warn warn people, definitely don't go shouting at a gin mm. and uh, telling it to F off and, and leave because uh, that's – it's going to let you, the, the backlash is not yeah. worth it and it doesn't work. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. So number three. We yes. go next. Yeah. Okay. So we just talked about the two most intense <laughs> entities. So now it's going to get a little easier mm -hmm. as we go through the rest of the list. Number three on the list is ghosts or discarnate mm -hmm. souls. This is the... I know everybody uses different terminology, but this is the terminology that I use to refer to a human soul that is no longer living. So it's out of its physical body. And for whatever reason, this soul, this human soul, did not complete its journey over to the other side. So there's a different experience where someone passes over and they go over to the afterlife and then sometimes they will come back to visit and that's a different situation that the energy is a lot a lot more clean and clear um it's not so ghosty and creepy right it's a, usually a very comforting visit from um aunt joanne or whoever family member uh, is showing up to comfort you right so we're talking about earthbound human souls those that are uh, at least for a short time or for a longer period of time stuck on the earth plane or choosing to stay on the earth plane either they got confused they had a sudden death and they don't realize that they're dead or they know that they're dead, but maybe they're afraid of the afterlife. Maybe they feel some guilt about something from their life. Or um, they did a lot of dark deeds when they were alive. And they're like, well, I don't know what's going to happen if I, if I mm. go into the light. Um, and some people um, stick around because they are very attached to experiences on the earth plane and specifically addictive experiences so if a person is um, actively addicted when they pass away sometimes they want to stick around on the earth plane so that they can attach to a living human and encourage that living human to act out their addiction it could be the same exact type of addiction let's say alcohol or a different kind of addiction mm. but they want to experience that through the person so they might be hanging out in the person's energy field attached via an energy cord or even especially when the person um, gets blackout drunk where when the living person gets blackout drunk their their soul steps aside and so the discarnate the the um, earthbound spirit often will step in and be working the person's body and drinking and enjoying mm. 
that that physical pleasure. Wow. And this is, um, you know, as I speak this, I'm just speaking the facts, but we acknowledge that people who are dealing with addiction, whether they are alive or deceased, it's a difficult situation that many people struggle with. But it is one of the reasons, it's one of the, the issues that can happen with discarnate souls, with ghosts. One of the things that we need to know is that whether a spirit, whether a ghost is on the positive end of the spectrum, so a friendly ghost, neutral or evil, because they were evil when they were alive, they were a dark person, and when they pass away, they're still dark. Whatever part of the spectrum they are on, it's not a good idea to have any type of ghost in your home. And I've had people disagree with me on this, and that's okay, we can disagree. But what I've seen is that uh, a ghost, a spirit that has not passed over, let's say a, a positive spirit, one who's trying to be helpful, they have to maintain their, their, their life force energy uh, in some way, shape, or form. And so the way that they maintain their energy is by hooking in and feeding off of those that are living, whether it's pets or people or, you know, adults, children. And so even if we have a friendly ghost in our home, somebody is being fed mm -hmm. on. Even if the ghost right. doesn't intend any harm, somebody's being fed on. And also we need to think in terms of like, do we really want this friendly ghost to be living forever in this house? Like, it really, it's better for them to move mm. on and move into the afterlife. So, in my opinion, so that would be a, that would be the solution we, is to help them become aware that they need to move on. Yes, yes, to help them become aware, and with a friendly, even fr from friendly to neutral ghost, oftentimes just talking to the ghost. And having a conversation, explaining things, so you don't have to be a psychic or specialize in in um, rescuing souls. You don't have to be a professional. You can have a conversation with the ghost and say, "Hey, you know, this it's okay. You can move on to the other side." And uh, you know, ask the person's guardian angels to come. You can say a prayer, whatever fits your particular belief system. But asking the person to move on to the other side can be helpful obviously they still have free will though so if they don't want to move on that's up to them but you still have the say as to who's allowed in your house so if they don't want to leave you're like but usually they will the friendly ghosts will go ahead and leave but if they don't want to leave it's like okay well we are the living humans who are living in this house now, and we're not allowing any ghosts mm. here. And so you can make them leave because you have authority over your physical space. And then obviously, if you have a negative ghost in your home, um, a lot of times the negative ghosts, um, a lot of times people will wonder if they're dealing with a demon even if it's not a being that is of the demonic realm, but it's a human soul. There are some human souls that are just so dark um, and troubled that they, they kind of give living people that same sort of feeling like the chill down the back of the spine, that feeling of doom, a feeling of darkness. Um, so there's a similarity there. Uh, the, years ago, about 30 years ago, I lived in a haunted farmhouse. I didn't know it was haunted when I moved in, but I found out very quickly. And, and there was, there were a variety of ghosts living there. I saw um, different women in pioneer clothing, holding babies and um, other, other people. And there was one ghost, though, that was very, very dark. And it was no, it did, it never appeared in human form. I never saw it in human form. It was just this black, blacker than black presence. Mm. And it was just this, this black energy. And um, I, my first book, Darkness Disguised as Light, I opened the book by talking about uh, that, that attack. Uh, this was when I was in my 20s. 
And um, I woke up and it, there was this black energy that was over me and I couldn't move. And that, that entity, along with a lot of the ghosts, they were living in the attic and that it was not a demon. I'm just thousand percent sure because I, I have a sense for how they feel since I've had so much entity encounter, so many entity encounters. This was definitely a human, but just super, super dark, psychopathic human. Mm -hmm. And it actually had trapped all of those other ghosts. It was not allowing them to leave. So that was an interesting mm. situation to observe. Mm. Um, and so, like I said, with good or neutral ghosts, usually saying a prayer or doing a smoke cleanse can, is usually all that's needed to get them to leave. But if you're dealing with either a super dark ghost or a demon here's a little tool we haven't given any tools yet burning frankincense mm. resin is uh, i really love phys physical tools like that because you don't have to spend years studying occult knowledge and it's great if you do then you have all of the the um, spiritual practices that you can do but let's say you don't have all that knowledge yet and you've got this really dark human spirit in your basement or a demon either way the frankincense resin burning frankincense resin is a great way to at least clear it out temporarily until you can um find a permanent solution real easy real easy solution yeah. Temporarily. Yeah, I have a couple of questions mm -hmm. about some solutions after sure. we finish with the, the final okay. entities here because we've got about 30 minutes left. So Two more. Okay. let's move on to what do we have for number four. Sure. Number four is a really interesting one. These are thought form entities. Mm. Thought form entities. They're also called tulpa, mm -hmm. T-U-L-P-A. And these are a lot different than the other types of entities that we've talked about so far, because what this is, is this is a phenom phenomena that's created by focused intent. So one or several people can focus their attention on creating an energy or an entity. They can use their mental focus, their emotional focus, and create an entity in this way. And then the next level to that is that in addition to using emotions and thought, a person who is uh, adept at occult practices can use uh, any flavor of black magic, whatever flavor they happen to be practicing, mm -hmm. Uh, or it doesn't have to be black magic. It can be uh, because we're a, a tulpa, a thought form entity can be used for good or bad. So they can use whatever occult practice, uh, beneficial or dark, to create an entity that is specifically created for the purpose maybe of right. healing or protection mm -hmm. or for harming a person. Okay, but even I've seen thought form entities. In fact, last week, my living in my world is kind of interesting because I get random information. And so I, I live out in the country. I spend all this time out here and I had this vision where uh, there's a, a church about a half an hour from me. And I saw the saint that is the patron saint of that church. And I saw that the saint that ha hangs out at that church is not the actual saint. It's not the actual spirit of that saint. It's actually a thought form entity. All the people at the church who have been praying, praying, praying to this saint, they've actually created a thought form entity wow. that is saint so-and-so. So, -and -so. so Thought form. So, so this actually um, brings up a question that my spiritual nerd brain has been thinking about for a while, which is okay, we know that there is such a thing as thought form entities, but is it possible that 
some of the deities that we think are real are actually thought form entities that have been created through prayer and prayer and prayer and focused thought and emotions and belief, 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 belief. Now, I'm not saying that I have the ultimate answer to that, but that is a big question mark in my mm. mind. So jumping over to the side here onto the negative aspect of thought form entities, I've worked with people who were, I've worked with clients who were dealing with um, people sending black magic their way and trying to harm them. And I've seen people who thought that they had demons attacking them. And when I would clairvoyantly look at the situation, I would see that, oh, these are actually not demons. The black magicians created thought form entities to send at the person and they created thought form entities to look like demons. The idea was to terrorize mm. the person. And in a recent incident, what was interesting to me is that the coven of witches that were doing this, they were not at the experience level to be able to actually call in and control demons, which is not a good idea for yeah. people to do. But there are people, there are people that mm. do it as a part of their practice. They were not at the experience level to know how to do that. It's not a good idea right. anyway. But they were at the experience level to be able to create thought form entities. Yeah. So they actually attacked this person with these thought form entities created to look like demons so the person thought that they were being attacked by all these demons and i said well the good news is you're not dealing with actual demons thought form entities are a lot easier to clear because they are uh, when i see them it's like they're halfway see-through like they're not fully formed energetically especially if those who have created them like this inexperienced somewhat inex inexperienced coven of dark witches they they really didn't have the ability to create fully formed entities mm -hmm. and so these thought form entities were really easy to clear so the a big takeaway is that thought form entities can be created just by um focused Our imagination by by imagination. So, okay, let's let's kind of jump over to a, another area that I haven't talked about. There are local tales in different parts of the world about like so and so entity or like um, uh, like this this area is known to have sightings yeah, like of Louisiana, so the Rougarou, the Beast of right, Bray Road, right, these right. different types of cryptids. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So when there are a lot of people who think about and believe in or maybe feel afraid of or or they're excited about all the different feelings, oh, maybe we'll see a sighting of some, such and such or whatever, or they're afraid of it, whatever, the whole spectrum, mm. all these people believing in that entity, whatever it is, whatever the being is, uh, then we we tend to see sightings of that being in that area. And I believe that's because it's actually sometimes a thought form entity. Interesting. Not always, but sometimes. Yeah, yeah I've considered mm -hmm. that as well. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, number five, what do we have? Number five. Number five is a unique category because this is an umbrella that's going to include some of the entities that we've already talked about. So number five is the term that I use, false light entity. Mm. A false light entity is any negative entity, including any that we've talked about before today, any negative entity of any kind that is pretending to be a benevolent entity so a negative entity that's pretending to be good so we also call these imposter entities we call them trickster beings um and so we talked about jinn 
Jin would fit under that umbrella because they are shapeshifters who are negative beings. Uh, every experience that I've had with Jin, by the way, has been negative. I've had people say that there are some that are positive. That might be mm. true. I've never met any that, that are positive. So we have Jin that are under this umbrella of false light entity. Uh, there are some ghosts, some negative ghosts that are adept enough at manipulating energy that they can shapeshift, but not as they're, they're just not as good at it as Jin. Jin are the masters mm -hmm. at it. And then we also have uh, demons that sometimes shapeshift. And then, you know, there really are infinite entities out there, by the way. Uh, and then you know, if we were to also include extraterrestrials, there are extraterrestrials that are really good, certain mm -hmm. ones that are really good at shape-shifting. And so, you know, we can really put any type of spiritual entity or any type of entity that's really good at shape-shifting, that's coming from a negative polarized place mm. that is pretending to be Now, good. I've wondered often okay. if what we understand as extraterrestrials may just be one of the previous entities we've discussed that are tricksters, that are shapeshifters, mm. that play on our mm. technological sci-fi understanding of the age and era we're in based mm. on all the movies we've seen. They might play off of that mm -hmm. emotion if we're sci-fi nerds or something like that. What do you think? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting theory. Um, I actually also read Rosemary Guiley's book, The Vengeful Jinn, and she talked about, uh, if, if I understand her point correctly, she talked about how she, in her opinion, she believes that uh, all just all sorts of uh, phenomenon that we experience, including fairies, ghosts, even alien encounters, and Bigfoot, all of that is gin. Mm. She she thinks that it's all gin. Um, I ha I feel feel blessed and lucky that I have the intuitive and psychic abilities that I do. I am an open minded questioner. So I'm always analyzing everything and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of forensic in my approach where um, I have my own personal and professional experiences and I'm feeling into it and I'm going, okay, I have this client who's having ET experiences, let's say, negative ET experiences. Uh, does this feel in any way like a gin? And um, sometimes that's a yes, but a lot of times it's, it's no, it's like, no, this, 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 the way that it's presenting, the way that it feels, the way that it's operating is like nowhere near how a gin mm. operates. Right. So I think that, uh, the thought that I have on what you just shared is that sometimes it can be the mm. case that there are shapeshifters pretending to be aliens or what have you, but I don't think that's always the case across the board. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one more mm -hmm. thing I want to explore when it comes to solutions and becoming aware of these things. It's actually a two-part question. First of all, there are some of these entities, I understand, that we have to make some sort of agreement with them in order for them to take control of certain aspects of our consciousness, whether we are aware of that agreement or we do it in our sleep or we do it because of some sort of addiction, that some of these entities require that agreement. And then we'll get to the second part after that. Okay. So... Yes, usually there is some type of an, an agreement, but what I see with the, the type of clients that I tend to attract um, are pretty wholesome kind of people because we tend to attract people that are similar vibration to us. And so these are not people who tended to like willingly uh make a demonic pact right, 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 for example right, yeah. uh, but but there are people that that do do that and i have helped people who've done things like that but most of the people that i've worked with are those that uh really never have been on that end of the spectrum but 
whether it's um, demonic beings or other types of negative beings, what's really common is to manipulate or trick a person into making an agreement. So most of the negative agreements that I see with clients uh, where they they have an attachment or they're they're under demonic rule, like their whole, uh, all the generations of their family are under demonic rule because some somebody was tricked, mm. or they will, or they were an active participant. Mm. They so so it can be a contract that the person themselves made or was tricked into, or further up in the generational line, there was a, a pact, a promise made. Uh, one thing that, that I've seen a lot is that a person who is actively working with the dark, knowingly working with the dark, will promise the rest of their generations to the demonic realm. Mm. And then, you know, even though all these other people in the generations to come didn't make that that contract, they didn't make that promise, the original promise still stands. So then when I have this client who is dealing with something from five generations ago, it is possible to undo that that original contract. Uh, so that those are some different ways that those agreements or contracts can be made. And no matter if the person made an agreement willingly or if it was through uh, manipulation or it was from another generation, 100% across the board, all negative contracts can be revoked. Mm. So if anybody's watching this who's like, oh my gosh, I did this thing when I was younger. I can't believe I did it. I've made a promise mm. to some kind of negative force. Uh, there is hope. At all of it can be revoked. Excellent. Okay. Now, this also goes yes. along with that as far as possible solutions of ridding these entities. The name of Jesus Christ is a very powerful tool, it seems, f towards some of these. And I've heard that even in some experiences with dark attachments, that it has no effect. What is your understanding of the power of the name, why it has effect on some and why it doesn't on others? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So first, I will start off by saying this is one of those questions that I am still working mm. through. Uh, it's one of those big existential questions of like, why does this work s with some entities and not with others, etc. cetera. But, uh, so I don't have the ultimate answer, but I do have a little bit to say about this. I will point out that demons tend to react very badly to and fearfully to the name of Jesus and also to uh, Mary, mm. Mother Mary, both. So they they respond very badly to both of those names, right? Very a lot of power there. Uh, but when it comes to Jin, Jin, coming from a different um, perspective, they actually really don't respond at mm -hmm. all to the name of Jesus. In fact, what they don't like is when you play. Um, an audio book of the Quran. Interesting. They hate that. Or if you play um, uh, uh, prayers, sung prayers from the Quran, uh, there are many uh, free prayer, free Arabic prayers, free Muslim prayers on YouTube that you can find if anybody's dealing with jinn issues. You can minimize it. Uh, it's not going to totally get rid of it, but you can weaken the energy by playing these prayers. So it's just an interesting, like, hmm, that's fascinating that this type of entity really hates the name of Jesus. This other type of entity hates the Quran, right? And why is that? I don't have the ultimate answer, but I'm sure this will start... Great it is, and I've already and got one video. more question I have to throw out there. You were mentioning Great. the thought forms and the tulpas and how you see them as 
sort of translucent, not fully formed. And I'm wondering if yeah. demons and jinn may be the same thing, except they've received so much power and intention over thousands and thousands of years that they're fully formed and have some sort of power over humanity because of the intention and the power of our own imagination and our creative abilities. We made them as well. What do you think? Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, my gosh. My my spiritual nerd brain is like, whoa, I'm going to be thinking about this for the rest of the day. Um, first thing that I'll say is that from my perspective, and I, I'm not G-O-D, I don't, I don't have like the ultimate truth about everything. I can just speak to my own perspective as someone who has pretty, pretty developed psychic abilities and a lot of experiences firsthand with entities and so as i've met these different entities in person not i mean not in yeah. the physical but you know what i mean in person i've met them and seen and felt and observed how they operate how they function how they feel what they look like to me jinn and demons are very different mm -hmm. and i've actually watched a lot of podcasts in the past different different podcasters who've who've kind of lumped demons and jinn together and they'll kind of be like oh demons and jinn is the same thing uh and i'd be like no not in my experience mm. like they they just have a very different like very different personality very different um mo very different appearance um and right now in my own seeking i'm curious about not just what's in the the holy uh, religious beliefs, but I'm really curious. I'm kind of on this seeking uh, right now of wanting to find out, like, where did these beings originally, originally, originally originate mm -hmm. from? And I th think that's kind of what you're wanting right. to know. Like, maybe they originated as the same thing, and then we... Uh, so. I find your um, hypothesis really fascinating because it kind of goes down another rabbit hole, which is how there are a lot of ways that we do create our own reality yeah. in this matrix mm -hmm. through like, like maybe through our thoughts and beliefs that we created God and, you know, all of that, like maybe, I don't know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not, but um yeah, so I don't have the right. ultimate answer. Well, on that's that, what this show is but, about: uh, is but, exploring all those possibilities. Yeah. And yeah. we got some great information yeah. today. Thank you so much, Maya. This was fantastic. We'll definitely have to do Fabulous. it again. Again, I feel like we kind of mm -hmm. just barely scratched the surface on some of this stuff. So we'll have you back before we close out. Though, remind the audience if they're interested in finding out more about you and may have some of these mm -hmm. troubles. What's the best way they can find out more about you? Absolutely. Okay. So the best place to go is psychicprotectionsanctuary.com. That's my website. And on the website, you can sign up for the email list where you can get a lot of information on the website. You can also click on work with Maya and you'll find my academy. So people who are dealing with major attacks uh, often need ongoing assistance and mentoring. So the Academy would be what you need. And you'll also see a listing of all my books on the website as well. Excellent. Maya, thank you so much. We'll definitely be doing this again. And until next time, everyone, have a wonderful evening. We'll talk again tomorrow. See y'all then.